In my opinion, I believe the most fascinating pieces of lost media are the ones that we can't confirm their existence. It's just really interesting that some forms of media are that unknown that we don't know much about them, leaving only rumors about them that have circulated for some time. And the lack of information coming from these types of lost media just gives them a very mysterious vibe. And I am very into stuff that's mysterious. Which is why I made this video where I'll be going over 8 pieces of lost media that are not confirmed to have existed. Without further ado, let's begin the video. John F. Kennedy was the 35th President of the United States and was President from January 20th, 1961 to November 22nd, 1963, becoming President after narrowly defeating Republican opponent Richard Nixon in the 1960 presidential election. During Kennedy's time as President, he had high tensions with communist states and countries, such as with Cuba during the Cuban Missile Crisis, which could have resulted in the breakout of a nuclear war and he would increase the number of American military advisors in South Vietnam, as well as authorize numerous operations to overthrow the Cuban government of Fidel Castro, which included a Bay of Pigs invasion in April of 1961. Kennedy presided over the establishment of the Peace Corps, Alliance for Progress with Latin America, and the continuation of the Apollo program, while having a goal of landing a man on the moon in the next coming years. In 1963, Kennedy decided to travel to Texas to smooth over frictions in the Democratic Party between liberals Ralph Yarborough, Don Yarborough, and conservative Texas Governor John Connolly, and the visit was first agreed upon by himself, Connolly, and Vice President Lyndon B. Johnson during a meeting in El Paso, Texas. In September of 1963, the trip was first announced, and the motorcade route was finalized on November 18th, and announced later. For his presidential motorcade, Kennedy had three basic goals in mind, which were to help raise more Democratic Party presidential campaign fund contributions, to begin his quest for re-election in the 1964 presidential election, and to help make political amends among several leading Texas Democratic Party members who appeared to be fighting amongst themselves. On November 22, 1963, at 11.38 a.m., John F. Kennedy and his wife, Jacqueline Kennedy, arrived at Love Field in northwest Dallas, Texas, where the motorcade cars were already lined up in order. The plan for the motorcade was to proceed through Love Field through downtown Dallas before arriving at the trademark at 12.15 p.m., where Kennedy would deliver a speech and share a steak luncheon with local government, business, religious, and civic leaders, and their spouses. And the people that were riding in the same car as Kennedy were his wife Jacqueline, Texas Governor John Connolly, Connolly's wife Nellie, driver agent Bill Greer, and Secret Service senior agent Roy Kellerman. At around 12.30 p.m. while in Dealey Plaza, John F. Kennedy was shot in the back with the bullet exiting out of his throat and was shot once again in the head, which would cause him to be taken to Parkland Hospital for emergency medical treatment, where he would be pronounced dead 30 minutes later at 1 p.m. Kennedy died at the age of 46, which makes him the youngest U.S. president to die as of making this video. And it should also be noted that Connolly was also wounded from the attack, but unlike Kennedy, he recovered. Because Kennedy was killed, Vice President Lyndon B. Johnson became the next president of the United States, since if a president dies, then whoever the vice president is would take the president's place. And while Kennedy was being shot, a Ukrainian-born American clothing manufacturer named Abraham Zapruder managed to capture his assassination in his own film, which is referred to as the Zapruder film. The film has been described as being the most complete out of all the films, and it gives a relatively clear view from a somewhat elevated position on the side from which the president's fatal head wound is visible. And even with it being the most infamous Kennedy assassination film, it didn't get shown to the public until 1975 when it aired live on ABC's Goodnight America. After John F. Kennedy's assassination, Lee Harvey Oswald, an order filler at the Texas School Book Depository from which the shots were fired, was arrested for assassinating Kennedy and also for the murder of police officer J.D. Tippett. 
However, many conspiracy theories that focus on possible accomplices in Kennedy's assassination have been brought up throughout the years, and one of those theories focuses on a lady wearing a babushka-style headscarf, seen in photos apparently filming during the assassination. And despite there being a huge historical significance of her footage, and there being a massive search for all Kennedy assassination eyewitnesses, the babushka lady has never been identified, and her film has never been released. In the images, you can see a dark-haired, heavy-set woman that appears to be in her late 30s or early 40s, wearing a voluminous tan trench coat, sunglasses, and a scarf over her head tied closely beneath her chin. And shortly after the assassination, she would become a major person of interest, during which all film and other images were being carefully examined for evidence of a secondary attacker, or of her accomplice on the grassy knoll to the far side of the road in question, which is an area where Kennedy's presidential motorcade had just passed before he was assassinated. The babushka lady can be seen in a small crowd standing on one side of the road, hence her visibility in several different photos, and she would garner a large amount of attention not only for her unusual unseasonal clothing, which might have been used for a disguise, but also because in the pictures taken immediately after the shooting began, while everyone around her is on the ground, she is seen still calmly standing by and facing the roadside, holding her hands up to her face in a manner that's similar to using a video camera. In 1970, a dancer named Beverly Oliver would step forward, claiming that she had recorded the motorcade using a Super 8 Yashica camera, and had turned over her film to two men claiming to be FBI agents. However, the two men would give her no receipts, and never return her film despite promising to do so, and Oliver would claim that she did not follow the matter up further out of fear of being arrested for marijuana possession. Eventually, Oliver would mention that she knew Jack Ruby, the man who would kill Lee Harvey Oswald while in custody, who in turn had introduced her to John F. Kennedy at a party. Although, her claim should be taken with a grain of salt, because she didn't give any piece of evidence to prove that she knew Ruby. It should be noted that the Yashica Super 8 camera wasn't yet being sold in the US market in 1963, which Beverly Oliver would explain that it was an experimental model given to her by a well-known friend. As of making this video, not a single one of the Babushka lady's photos have been found, and it is unknown if the photos even exist at all. Many theorize that her camera was actually a gun, which would explain Oliver being given an experimental camera model, or that she was there to record something that was part of the plot for later blackmail, or other purposes. Cannon Hunt is a rumored Atari 8-bit game that was released in 1982 by a company called Micromagic Software, and the game was supposedly released on both disc and tape, and was also released exclusively in the United States. However, no copies of the game are currently known to exist, with the game's Atari Mania page giving both the disc version and the tape version a 10 in terms of their rarity ranks. And the only other piece of information about Cannon Hunt that we know of is that it was apparently written using BASIC. As rare as Cannon Hunt is, things get even more interesting surrounding the game when you realize that we don't know if the game was even released, or at the very least was in development. There is, however, a possibility that the game might have been a clone of the Bally Astrocade game Artillery Duel, but with cannons instead of tanks. There's also a possibility that the Sega Genesis game Cannon might be a remake of Cannon Hunt, although that theory has yet to be confirmed. Cartoon Network Battle Crashers is a 2016 crossover beat 'em up game featuring characters from six different Cartoon Network shows, which are Steven Universe, Uncle Grandpa, The Amazing World of Gumball, Clarence, Regular Show, and Adventure Time. The game was released for the PS4, Xbox One, Nintendo Switch, and Nintendo 3DS. And in the game, the player can either take control of Steven Universe, Uncle Grandpa, Gumball, Clarence, Mordecai and Rigby, and Finn and Jake, while traversing through the worlds of each of their respective shows, and defeating mere clone versions of each respective character. Apparently, there is a rumor that the game was going to have a release on the Nintendo DS, 
However, the only evidence of the port's existence is a low-quality version of the box art appearing on the page for the game on the website for Game Mill Entertainment, who are the publishers for the game. As of making this video, it is unknown why the port was cancelled. However, it can be speculated that the DS, being considered an obsolete handheld at the time, could have contributed to it. It is also unknown if anything beyond the box art was made for the DS version of the game. On July 28, 1969, two bands would film a purported sex video in the Edgewater Inn, located right on Elliott Bay in Seattle, Washington. And those two bands were Led Zeppelin and a lesser-known band known as Vanilla Fudge, who had a hit in 1968 with their cover of The Supremes' You Keep Me Hanging On. The two bands were on tour when filming the video, and at the time, the Edgewater Inn would allow guests to fish out of the window of their room directly into the bay. While it isn't exactly known what went on during the filming of the video, it is known that the incident involved the members of Vanilla Fudge, one of Led Zeppelin's road managers Richard Cole, and supposedly some or all of the members of Led Zeppelin. According to what happened, they were stuffing pieces of a dead shark into a woman's vagina and rectum. <sighs> yeah, I am not making that up. But anyways, Richard Cole had spoken about the film before. Although, he goes into detail a bit too much at some points in his retelling of the film. And it is also known that Mark Stein of Vanilla Fudge said that he had filmed the footage of the incident, and he tagged along a girl along with Carmine Apiche, their drummer. Stein also had said that he had given the tapes to Vanilla Fudge's road manager, Bruce Wayne. And no, it is not the Bruce Wayne you are most likely thinking of. As of now, the video has yet to be found, although we aren't even certain if it's real or not. But even if it is real, I don't think many people would want to see it due to it containing sexually explicit material. Mario's Castle was an unreleased game that was going to be released on Nintendo's unreleased handheld console, Project Atlantis, and was presumably part of the Mario franchise. In case you aren't familiar with what Project Atlantis is, Project Atlantis was going to be a handheld game console that was supposed to be a successor to the original Game Boy. And apparently, if it did release, then it's highly likely that the Game Boy Advance would have not seen development. The console would start to be worked on in 1995, and one year later in 1996, issues of Electronic Gaming Monthly and Game Informer started listing specs for the console, including that it had 32-bit color, 4-face buttons, and a 3x2 LCD screen. The magazines would also mention that Project Atlantis was to be released in late 1996 or early 1997, and Nintendo would even officially confirm the console's existence, but delayed the official release date until late 1997, before the console would be cancelled sometime during 1997 or 1998, without the public being notified of its cancellation. In the same Electronic Gaming Monthly magazine that listed the specs, it also mentioned that there was going to be a new game for the console titled Mario's Castle, and Nintendo was going to produce it. Almost nothing else is known about the game, except that it was going to be a launch title for the handheld, and it is likely that the game was cancelled the moment Project Atlantis was cancelled. As of making this video, no other information about Mario's Castle has been given from any official gaming media source, other than the Electronic Gaming Monthly article, and it is also unknown if the game was incorporated into another Mario game at a later time, although it isn't likely. Mix is a Filipino cable music channel operated by ABS-CBN, and the channel was known to primarily target youths and air music videos. Mix would originally start out as a programming block for ABS-CBN's UHF channel Studio 23 in 2000, before it would later become a standalone 24-hour pay channel in 2002, and five years later in 2007, an international version of the channel was created. In May of 2011, at around 8 to 9 p.m., a strange broadcast, allegedly an intrusion, was rumored to have occurred on the channel. 
and in October of 2022, a Reddit user known as Colin McKenzie would bring up the intrusion on the tip of my tongue, help me find, and Philippine subreddits. Colin McKenzie would describe the broadcast intrusion going like this. The intrusion would occur while Mix was airing their commercials for different programs, before their channel would suddenly display color bars, until minutes later when it would transition to veins with blood flowing at different angles, before it would later transition into a slow mirrored footage of a beating heart with strange noises, or incomprehensible speaking and moans of a woman in the background. Mix would eventually be notified of the intrusion and interrupt it with a black or white backdrop, along with the logo of Mix with its slogan, Your Choice, Your Music. Upon Colin McKenzie posting to Reddit, several people would mention that they also recall seeing the broadcast, and eventually a Facebook commenter would bring up the broadcast, in which the commenter said, quote, I've experienced what was being said in Mix. At the time, I was studying for our final exams in culinary. When I'm reviewing either an infomercial channel or the mix channel is playing in the background, suddenly I heard a very loud moan, then I looked back at our television and there was a really strange darkish red stuff. I'm not sure how to explain it because my heart jumped up. Then it was followed up by a long toot. Then it was followed up by random videos from mix. Then the rainbow bars appeared. Then they showed the Mix logo with their tagline, Your Choice, Your Music. I literally went to Ministop at an untimely hour and I reviewed there instead. Unquote. Various theories about the intrusion have been brought up over the years, such as it occurring due to reception issues from other channels, or the channel having transmission problems. Some people also believe that the intrusion was nothing but a music video, and some even believe that the intrusion was a television hijacking. In fact, Colin himself would bring up the hijacking theory on Reddit, although that would later be dismissed due to the Mix logo in the upper right corner being present when the quote-unquote intrusion happened, similar to other commercials on the channel. The most likely theory, according to many, is that the intrusion video was simply a promotional or a commercial, and there is evidence to back this theory up, since there have been previous cases where other ABS-CBN channels, such as Studio 23 in 2008 for example, aired creepy found footage style commercials, similar to the footage in the movie The Blair Witch Project. One eyewitness who claims to have seen the possible commercial, recalls a similar commercial that aired on Studio 23 in either 2009 or 2010, and it depicted a boy inappropriately touching a girl, accompanied by color bars. The intrusion or commercial that Colin McKenzie brought up on Reddit is rumored to have aired on Studio 23 and ABS-CBN, although those rumors have yet to be verified. A recreation of the commercial or intrusion was made by iRepublic on May 20th, 2023, and Colin himself would say that it was identical to the original, although the heartbeat was a bit slow and there were veins with blood flowing in the real broadcast. Can hey, your shampoo do this? Take the clear black light challenge. In 2013, Mountain Dew would release a series of commercials directed by American rapper Tyler the Creator, and in each commercial, a character that was created and voiced by Tyler, known as Felicia the Goat, would make an appearance. A total of three commercials were made and all of them can be seen on YouTube to this very day. In the first commercial, Felicia can be seen assaulting a waitress. In the second commercial, Felicia gets pulled over by the police in suspicion of Do You I? In the third commercial, Felicia is in a police lineup with five African-American males, and the waitress from the first commercial returns to identify Felicia, but gets intimidated out of it by Felicia and flees the police station. 
Eventually, the commercials would face major backlash, with them getting multiple accusations that were led by commentator Boyce Watkins, who would write an article about the advertisements that was titled, Mountain Dew Releases Arguably the Most Racist Commercial in History. Watkins would criticize the ads for multiple reasons, such as the ads only using black men in the police lineup, and for promoting the snitches get stitches mindset. Snitches get stitches, foe. And within 24 hours of Watkins posting his article, PepsiCo, which is known for owning Mountain Dew along with many of her soda brands, would cancel the campaign, causing the campaign to end at the third commercial. There is speculation of a fourth commercial that would continue the Felicia the Goat storyline, and during an interview with Billboard, Tyler the Creator and his manager Christian Clancy answered questions regarding the controversy. During the interview, Billboard's Julianne Escobedo Shepard would ask if there was a fourth ad and if it would air, to which Clancy would refer the question to Mountain Dew. And as of making this video, there is absolutely no confirmation that a fourth commercial was conceived or in production. On January 15, 2001, an online open collaboration encyclopedia known as Wikipedia was formed by Jimmy Wales and Larry Sanger, and ever since then, it has become the largest online encyclopedia ever, with it having over 55 million articles spanning 300 different languages. Prior to 2019, it was believed by many that the oldest surviving edit on Wikipedia was made the day after it was created, and a user operating on the eiffel.demon.co.uk server created the page UUU, which listed countries beginning with the letter U. However, in 2019, an import of UseMod Wiki revisions, discovered by Wikimedia developer Tim Starling in 2010, revealed that there was an edit made on the day Wikipedia launched. The edit was made by a user utilizing the office.bombus.com server, and in the edit, the page, homepage, was created with the text, This is the new Wikipedia, with the reason homepage and UUU are oddly titled, is because UseMod Wiki only allowed for camel case links, which are links without spaces or punctuation, and with capitalized words that are after the first word, which were the norm until February 19, 2001, when Wikipedia would utilize free links. On August 13th, 2019, users began to showcase to one of Wikipedia's founders, Jimmy Wales, what appeared to be the oldest edit on Wikipedia. However, Wales would respond saying that there were even earlier edits than that one, and that according to Wales, he experimented with UseMod Wiki and deleted several early Wikipedia edits on the hard drive, and also that the first edit was on the homepage with the text, Hello World. On December 3rd, 2021, this claim would gain a bit of traction when Wales announced he would be selling an NFT that recreated the edit, before it was eventually sold on Christie's for $750,000 on December 15th. I should also mention that Wikipedia's first edit was first reported in an article by The Guardian over 12 years ago on January 13th, 2011. Based on Wales' comments, the source for the original edit is permanently lost because of how it was immediately wiped from the server, leaving not a single trace of its existence. However, despite Jimmy Wales claiming that the Hello World edit was Wikipedia's first edit, his claim has been called into question since not long after The Guardian published the article on the Hello World edit, Joseph Regal, a professor and prominent Wikipedia contributor, requested a source for the Hello World edit, stating that, based on the archive made by Tim Starling, the This Is The New Wikipedia was indeed the first edit to Wikipedia, which was published at 7.27pm. Having created a website in December of 2010 that contains the first known 10,000 Wikipedia edits, Regal would mention again in December of 2021 that the This Is The New Wikipedia edit was still the first Wikipedia edit. And not only did Joseph Regal dispute Jimmy Wales' claim, but Tim Starling himself would also dispute his claim, mentioning that a test wiki was created on January 10th, 2001, which was deleted not long after its creation. Starling believes that while the Hello World edit may have been the initial edit on Wikipedia, he is pretty confident that the first edit on Wikipedia, while it was still utilizing UseMod Wiki, was the edit that featured This Is The New Wikipedia. He also provided a link where Larry Sanger referred to this wiki. 
Another influential Wikipedian named David Lindsay responded to Regal's 2010 email, stating that the Hello World edit likely occurred on the now inaccessible wiki hosted on Newpedia, which was not originally known as Wikipedia. Thus, Wikipedia's first edit might have been the initial Newpedia wiki edit, but not the first Wikipedia one. Joseph Regal would analyze Jimmy Wales NFT of Wikipedia's initial edit, and found an inaccuracy with the timestamp, since the timestamp said it was made at 7.29pm, which would mean that the edit occurred after the This Is The New Wikipedia edit, which occurred at 7.27pm. However, Wales would later update the timestamp to show 6.29pm, which, assuming it's the true time, would mean that it occurred 58 minutes before the first edit, and to this day it is unknown whether the 7.29pm claim was made in error and whether the 6.29pm timestamp is accurate, assuming the edit occurred on Wikipedia.